Welcome to another installment in our webinar series, Integrating Circular Metrics in Green Star Projects. Let's get into it. Let's get started. So just a quick word from me. Circularity is not a new thing. I have been around for a while now, you could say, and even when I was at uni, we were talking about Stop laughing, Jim. We were talking about things like industrial symbiosis and making the most of everything that we have. When we got to 2008, the famous Cradle to Cradle book was published by Brown, Gart and McDonough. And that really elaborated in a lot more depth how the full concept of holistic circularity can work. And really what we want to do today is we want to move away from the concept of waste avoidance and recycling so that kind of definition of circular economy is absolutely out at this point in time. We're moving into holistic circularity and systems thinking in its broadest scale. So when we're looking at our projects, we want to think circularity the whole way through everything that we're doing and not just when we get to the end and what happens with that. So with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker and he's going to introduce you to what the GBCA is doing. There's some really exciting developments there. So grab the screen share, Jorge, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much, Nicole. And I'd like to uh, very briefly just also note, acknowledge the traditional owners of land in which we're gathered within the land of the Gadigal. I'm in the C our Sydney office in lovely Barn Group. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Briefly speaking, I think from our perspective, we've been looking at the question of circularity for a while. Uh, we started working on, on the the like how to integrate circularity metrics better in green stuff. I mean, realistically speaking, all the way, as you said, Nicole, from uh, when we're trying to do this in, in Office version 3 and so on, where we're trying different aspects. What's changed, I would say, in the past few years is that it's become, it's gone from a, a few things that we would try in the rating tools to starting to inform how we develop the rating system per se. So I'm going to walk you through what's going on and what are the elements that are new and interesting happening in Green Star. So I presume at this point you all know what the Green Building Council of Australia does, or I hope you do. We are we are a industry association dedicated to transforming the built environment and amongst our many activities which include advocating to local, state and federal governments, we're best known for Green Star. Uh, we have the Green Star rating system has been undergoing a big revision over the past few years. Um, we're essentially almost done, I should say. Oh, there's a small mistake there. Communities, communities, it will be coming out in early 2025. It's essentially approved. We're just wrapping up through the guidelines, and the fitouts will be will be released next year. We also have what we call our responsible products program as part of the Green Star Future Focus piece, which is how do we influence manufacturing industry and how do we tell work with product certification schemes to outline what it is that we're trying to achieve. So I'm actually going to walk you through different parts of the rating system and show you how we're integrating circularity throughout. But first, why is it important? Why are we focusing on circularity? We see a lot of the elements or impacts from the built environment, and they're significant. If you think about the fact that 40% of energy-related global carbon emissions are associated with buildings, 25% are related to material production and construction, 50% of global material use is due to buildings, and the just incredible amount of materials that are consumed by the sector we really need to figure out how to reduce the amount of virgin resources that we're using, maximize and utilize as much as possible what it is that we're building and try and make it last or make it as adaptable as we can. And I'm starting to think more from a holistic perspective rather than, as Nicole said, just recycling stuff. How do we do that better? When we set out our strategy in 2018, we looked at these three areas of activity alongside the other green building councils worldwide. Focusing on climate action, resources and circularity, and health and well-being. This gave us our mantra for what we were doing across the next decade. And that was in 2018. And then we set out to revamp the rating system. And in 2021, we released Green Star Buildings, the, the latest revision to our rating tool for new construction. And we started also doing some work on circular economy. Uh, when we we're doing Green Star Buildings, for example, we very strongly felt it was important to look at uh, starting to really push for reducing upfront carbon emissions. Um, now, of course, everyone's really into that space, reducing energy consumption. Yes, we were diverting construction waste from landfill, but also we started to look at how do we maximize the benefits from the reuse of existing structures, facade systems, and finishes. And one of the big changes that we did, for example, between Green Star Design as built and Green Star Buildings is you effectively can get a four-star rating if you're reusing significant portions of an asset. That was a very specific aspect of what we were set out to do. And so we wanted to continue building on that. So we released the 
circular economy leadership challenge. We're starting to try some of the material circularity indicators and the circularity transition indicators, trying to get people to start playing around with those. And anecdotally, we've actually seen a fair bit of interest in that leadership challenge, which was very exciting, gave us a lot of confidence. We also released a circular economy discussion paper where we tried to figure out where industry was, like what's the status of industry? What are you all thinking? How are you interpreting the circular economy? We've done a lot of work since. In 2022, we finished the first version of what we call the Responsible Products Guidelines for Product Certification Schemes. That actually includes a circular category. Um, most of you wouldn't be seeing them. They're really they're really useful for those that are for the initiatives and product certification schemes rather than project teams. But circularity indicators in those standards are things that we look at. We then did a bit of work with the Better Buildings Partnership around having a circular procurement guide. And for feedouts, we launched our scoping paper for Green Star Feedouts, and I'll talk a lot about that. And we also started doing advocacy at the state level. And we did a piece of work with the South Australian government on circularity in that state, for example. And then, of course, we get to this year. And this year has been a year of circular activity for us, for lack of a better word. And I'm going to go through each of these very quickly. So in Green Star Feedouts, which is a rating tool, the upcoming rating tool for new construction, which is in development right now, and we are going to introduce a circular category in the rating system. So the rating system itself is a very different rating system for, from Green Star Interiors. The circular category is going to have a set of credits that are trying to drive circulars to be designed and built to be a lot more circular from the inception all the way to the end, their end of life. Now, I was going to spend a lot of time saying we should go through each of these credits, but rather than doing that, I'm going to point you to start keeping an eye out for our website uh, for Monday. Uh, we will actually be launching draft credits for consultation, and they're fairly complete credits, and we look for your feedback then. You will have an entire two months to go through those credits because we know you're on holidays by the time, and we're expecting your feedback. When it came to Green Star Buildings, though, we announced that we would be doing a revision to, to the rating system and release a version 1.1. So we went out for consultation this past year. So in version 1, we have a credit called Lifecycle Impacts. And what we started looking at and what we always aim to do with that credit was trying to get people to think about the other stages that aren't covered during the design and construction of the building. So we have an upfront carbon emissions credit. So what, what happens for end of life emissions or how do we prepare for things? And we introduced, we, we had, we've had the life cycle assessment credit for a while, but we felt we could start increasing the requirements in that space. So we're doing a few things. One, you will continue to get rewarded for a life cycle assessment that we're lowering the thresholds a bit. Uh, and, but you're gonna have to figure out and you're gonna have to tell us how you're actually addressing the end of life. And we proposed the idea of maybe we can ask for people to have a design for this assembly plan. There's other options that we've gotten some good feedback on that we will introduce that we'll talk about it at a later stage. But the more exciting one was a pathway to which we said, well, what if we tried to articulate circularity metrics, what if we use, as a first step, we try and get people to start thinking about circularity and we just reward people measuring circularity. And let's look at structure and envelope. Thankfully for us, ISO 59020 came out at around the same time as we were thinking about this. And we realized that we could actually use that standard to start measuring circularity. That also happens to be a really good standard because it fits into the circularity transition indicators or the MCI method by Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And that meant that we could start uh, picking up the actual variables that we needed to pick up from a data, a data perspective and also ask people to start becoming familiar with these metrics or methods of circularity. And I won't try and explain this in detail. That's what we have Jim here for. That's important. But it became an opportunity for us to actually outline, hey, Maybe we do need to start incentivizing industry in this space. It's a new area, but we think it's going to be a growing area. So we proposed that we would do essentially the, uh, we would ask for the circularity metrics, but also see if there was potentially, if it was possible for people to calculate an improvement against a reference. Um, and that's what we're going to try and aiming to do. There's also some additional circularity metrics that we're going to be pick up, picking up. We'll be doing some work with WBCSD around this. And so we are, we, we put a call out, I think last month, for people to join a pilot program that WBCSD is doing on their uh, circularity transition indicators for buildings pilot program. And we, we are going to be working with those projects to give them a point. That's so we can start again, just getting people familiar with the process of going through the, the circularity metric collect data collection that we need and to help WBCSD improve the method.
And then we get to the responsible product space, which is the last area of activity that we're doing. As I've said, the responsible products guidelines version A, uh, we do have uh, some circularity elements in it. There's a circularity category in the guidelines that we assess initiatives against. And it looks at these four areas. And you know, when we developed this a few years back, this is the best we could do at the time. We, we, we worked hard to, to try and have good criteria that we can assess things at. Understanding that the manufacturing industry really hadn't been asked to deal with this stuff. So we had to think about how do we structure it so we can be successfully start telling people this is important, but not penalize people for not having done something that they didn't know what to do. We started looking at different frameworks since we've done version A a few years back. And these are all things that have come out. And we started looking at what other indicators we needed to introduce into the guidelines and both internationally and domestically. These are just a sample of the things that we've been looking at. Uh, and we're actually going to be driving what we call a version B of the guidelines. We're starting to create a revision so that we can start working with the manufacturing sector and product certification initiatives on what the future looks like, right? We want to, instead of trying to assess them for what they do today, we want to give guidance on what they should be doing in the future. And amongst the many things that we're doing is increasing or addressing additional criteria around nature, resource consumption, and circularity better. Because we do think that those are areas that are going to be particularly impactful for all of us. And we need to start trying to tell the manufacturing industry, start sending signals as to what it is that we're expecting them to do. So this is still something that we started to kind of just work on fairly recently. There will be more information as we go on. But those are a good snapshot, I think, of the activities that we've been doing. But there is one more thing. We've been working very strongly on trying to do a comprehensive guide to circular procurement as part of the activities that we're doing this year and to get people ready for next year's for all of the introduction of the multiple things on circularity that are coming into Green Star Buildings 1.1 and Green Star Fitouts. And so that should come out next year in 2025. That's it for me, Nicole and Jim. All yours. Back at you. Thanks, Jim. I'll Perfect. just just sharing my screen. Fantastic. Yeah, so I'm going to take you uh, through uh, the circularity metrics. As, as Nicole said, I've been involved in this area uh, pretty much since the beginning uh, during the early discussions with uh, the other MacArthur Foundation around the need for circularity metrics. So that's what I'm going to take you through today and how some of these metrics work. We've heard the MCI and CTI mentioned so we'll touch on how both of those work. Uh, so the reasons to measure circularity is, mean, firstly, we can't improve what we don't measure. You know, we need to be able to benchmark the circularity of our products and our projects. We need to be able to use it in design to evaluate and communicate the circularity of our projects. We also need to be able to optimize the benefits from circularity. So comparing circularity against the economic, environmental, and social benefits that we're trying to realize, and they don't always go hand in hand. So we need to understand where where there are synergies and where there are opportunities to, to, to maximize the benefits from circular systems. The challenge that we have at the moment is if, we, if we're only using metrics that are based on recycling, then recycling is the only solution we're going to get. Uh, and we need a way of talking about circularity that is much more holistic and incorporates those different uh, aspects of, of, the, of the circular economy. And the reason for that is, you know, there is a hierarchy within the circular economy that goes from the linear economy through to energy recovery, recycling, remanufacturing, reuse and avoidance. And what we tend to find is that as we move up that, that ladder from the lower levels to the higher levels, we tend to realize more uh, economic, environmental and social benefits. Uh, so how do we really bring those through as part of the design process? How do we embed that more holistic view of circularity in our projects so that we can we can maximize the value we get out of it? Now, the challenge we found right at, right at the beginning and the reason why we set about developing the material circularity indicator with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is, uh, is one of comp comparability. We have a lot of different levers within the circular economy, designing out materials, biomaterials, durability, shared use, reuse, remanufacturing. And the way we measure these is all different. And that's, that's problematic because firstly, it means we can't compare different strategies against each other. It also means we can't combine these strategies and understand the net, in, net impact of them. And that's that's why we set about uh, developing these, these indicators. We now, as uh, Sorge says, we have a standard so that's, that's come out, the ISO 59020 standard, which I've been working on for the past four years. That standard now defines the indicators that we need to use to, to calculate circularity. We also have two methods of calculating circularity that, that align with that standard. Um, ironically, those those methods came out before the standard did. So the material circularity indicator first came out in 2015, 
and the circular transition indicators came out in 2020. The important thing about these two methods is that they are scalable, so we can use them to calculate the circularity of materials or products made of materials or projects that incorporate products. Um, so we can use the circularity evaluation of a product and combine that across multiple projects in, products into a project and understand the circularity of that project. So they're very useful in that respect because we can we can take data from our suppliers and combine them into our project to understand the overall circularity. Now, generally speaking, that within the MCI and the CTI, there are three components that you can think of. We have the material inflows, so where the products are coming from, how much is reused, remanufactured, recycled, and where the materials are going to, so how much is recovered from use, how much is reused, remanufactured, recycled, composted. Those two components together go towards a, an element of quantifying the reduction in reliance on uh, non-renewable resources and waste production. And in the middle, we have uh, an element that, that focuses on product use. So the utility of the product versus a reference. And uh, this is more about avoidance, because if you can make something last twice as long, you need half as much material to fulfill the same function over the, that period of time. So what the, the, the MCI and the CTI do is take those components and distills them down into a single score that gives you a circularity between 0% uh, and 100% circular, which is easy to communicate and gives you a, a realistic perspective of how all of those different factors uh, combine to give you a, a decoupling from non-renewable resource consumption and waste. Now, we obviously have two methodologies. You know, are they compatible? And the answer, thankfully, is yes. Uh, the only real difference is the final calculation. They both use the same input and output flows. They both use the same uh, utility calculation. Uh, the only real differences are, you know, the CTI uh, reports utility separately from what it calls circularity, so the material inflows and outflows. So you end up with two two metrics, uh, whereas the MCI integrates those metrics into one. That's not a big difference because you can actually use the outputs from a CTI to calculate an MCI in a, in a very simple step. In terms of utility, they both use the lifetime of the product versus an average. The MCI also uses alternatives like shared use and light weighting. Within the CTI, the, the UT, that utility team tends to get to apply it to the entire product, uh, whereas within the MCI, you can, you can attach a utility to an individual component and have different forms of utility for different components, uh, which gives you a, a bit more uh, flexibility in your assessment. And as I said, the CTI results and the MCI results align very closely, so there's not really that much difference. Uh, in terms of the output. In terms of how you go set about implementing the CTI, the methodology is open. Uh, they're currently on version four. The methodology is available through the CTI tool, which is a tool to by Circular IQ, uh, which includes a streamlined LCA tool. The, that tool is free in the basic version for the first assessment. And then beyond that, you have a pay per use model. On the MCI, uh, again, the methodology is open. It's been stable since 2015, has been revised in 2019 and more recently in 2024. It works with most LCA tools. So you'll find that within Gabby and Envision, there's native support for the calculation of MCI. Uh, within SEMA Pro, Open LCA, one-click LCA. I'm not actually advancing that. There is some setup needed, but it, again, MCI has been used uh, within each of those, uh, those environments. Uh, it's also integrated in some digital product passport systems. We heard Jorge mentioning some of those earlier. We also have a free Excel tool uh, for the MCI available on our website. You're free to download that and, and play with it to get, uh, get yourselves familiar. And as an example, just to finish up, we have seen the MCI uh, used for quite some time. InfraBuild were the first out of the door in terms of publishing their, their material circularity indicator alongside their EPD. Um, so they, they now include the circularity of their products as part of their EPD. The advantage of this is that LCAs, EPDs, and MCI and CTI use very much the same data. You know, it's the, the same information that you're dealing with uh, for the most part. So calculating circularity at the same time as an LCA or an EPD is a relatively uh, cheap add-on. Uh, so it's an easy, easy, easy additional step. And we're seeing that uh, that progress more. So the eco platform for the circular economy task force is considering more formal adoption of MCI within EPDs. And we're seeing that hopefully over the next year coming through as, as something a bit more formalized. With that, I'll stop because I'm aware we're kind of running towards the end of our session, uh, but I'll stop and ask for any questions. Thank you very much to both of you. That was fascinating and 
it, it became really clear that we're on the cusp, I think, of quite a significant change in the way that we're dealing with circularity at the moment. Now, I'm going to come to you first. I said we're on the cusp, but, but I feel like we don't quite know what we're doing with circularity and circular economy quite yet in the built environment. We've got some ideas, but I don't think we know how to put them together very well. So if industry don't know how to do it all that well yet, why is GBCA already putting it in your rating tools? That is an excellent question. We have a, a fairly long history of kind of doing that for what it's worth, because what we're trying to do is build a market. We want to send signals to industry based on the trends that we're seeing, right, from overseas and uh, finance and, 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 you know, obviously just the actual impact that we're having on the environment, that this is an area that we think industry needs to place a strong focus on. And so when you look at anything that we do, we kind of try and say, well, let's measure first, like let's try and figure out some measure or some process that we, or have a process to articulate this and do measurements so we can set a benchmark and then we can do improvements. And obviously a lot of things go well with that, some others don't, but this is one where we can actually achieve that. And we try and do it through a leadership challenge first and then introducing into the rating tool, eventually maybe becomes a requirement. So that's the example of what we did with LCA what was it, 2012, right? And EPDs, we create a market through our leadership challenges and now upfront carbon emissions is a requirement in the rating system. So we're trying to paint that signal to industry saying this is important. And hopefully we can all learn from that space. That's that's really what we're aiming to do here. Lee Matthew has put a question in the questions there. Would you recommend a particular LCA software like eTool or OneClick for incorporating circularity in the LCA credit? He's got credits 21 and 26. I cannot answer that question for sure. <laughs> yeah. Jim, are you aware of where those tools are up to with that or any other comment you'd like to add? In terms of the incorporation of circularity metrics, uh, there was some, I'd say probably Gabby and Envision are the ones that are most closely supporting the MCI. They were, they were quite early adopters. And as I said, within Gabby and Envision, there is native support for calculation of, of the MCI. But the calculations for circularity aren't that complicated uh, compared you know, once you once you have your LCA data available. And so it should be a relatively straightforward process to add that on as within within most of those environments. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with with all of the software tools, nor nor am I going to make a, you know, specific recommendations on on a particular software package. But I, I would say that Gabby and Envision are probably the the most advanced from what I've seen. Thank you. And and maybe just a, a final question. Sorry, someone's just popped one in. It will be hard to dislodge, oh, thank you, Andrea, for your question. It will be hard to dislodge the perception that recycled content is the metric to aim for. Mm, valid statement. What is the GBCA doing to educate industry rather than sending a signal? Because a signal might take a bit too long to get there. Oh, yeah, that's a great question, Andrea. When we say sending a signal, we include, like, we, we're, we're throwing a lot of things at it, right? So we're obviously putting it in the rating tool. I say, you, you should do this and it's heavily weighted. So there's going to be attractive. We're running a lot of courses and uh, and, and training on this. We'll, we'll likely, uh, we're expecting that we'll need to create a guide also that's more, a bit more comprehensive to be uh, to figure out how to interpret some of the elements in the standard. And so we're saying a signal, but when I say a signal, it's not like a little Morse code. We're probably putting in a Megadeth concert sort of style situation here. The But the point about your point about the question on recycling, that is also a good one. And there's a few things that I think we're trying to deal with that. One of the bits that we've been working on is trying to do a piece of work around, for instance, changing, and I know we're kind of saying waste is not it, but for example, in waste, we are trying to articulate and say, let's change the benchmarks. So instead of focusing on recycled content going to that, that's, that's, uh, that's being, or how much waste is, is getting recycled, which is what the current just waste metrics look like. If you just wanted to look at that in construction and demolition waste, we're going to shift them to be amount of waste generated from site. And that starts articulating different ways of starting to look at the problem. It's again, you might say a signal, but it's a, what we are it's part of a package of things that we're kind of throwing at people saying this is more important than just recycling. This is more important than just sending stuff or, or, or not sending stuff to landfill. This is about not generating. This is about appropriate selection. This is about design considerations, contract clauses, and so on. So we're, we, are, we are doing a lot of work around this. Oh, range. Yeah, that's excellent. And, mm -hmm. and really, we're, we're working to really build 
a new language and a new way of looking yep. at things. So we're not, we don't want to talk about end of life anymore. We want to talk about end of use and what happens next. We want to move from thinking about waste to thinking about resources and resource management and how yeah. those resources move forward and, and how we plan for that right back at the start before we employ the resources to begin with. And, and, you know, in our case as well, we have the rating system that covers different, let's say, time frames of a building. So lining everything up so that it, it, the system itself is strongly encouraging reuse, extension of life, adaptability, rather than just, you know, the, the, the construction of new things, effectively. I'm going to go with one more question. We are running late, so I understand if people need to drop off. So our last question, Valeria has asked, Thanks so much for the webinar. I wonder how mature is the market for reclaimed materials and are there any gaps in demand or supply chains for such materials? Is there sufficient infrastructure to support advanced sorting, recycling and manufacturing processes required for circularity? And how accessible and cost effective are take back programs or material banks for fit out projects in Perth? Oh, that's very specific. Uh, that's a big question. I'll give you 30 seconds each. Jim? Oh, you hey, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can give you my brief answer. I, I think there is. I mean, oh, he mentioned the digital, digital product passports earlier. I think there is a significant need, certainly in the construction sector, when we start dealing with uh, long lifetime components. The amount of information and uh, assurance needed to to reuse some of those products requires an additional level of granularity because it's not just a question of talking about a generic product anymore. It's a question about talking about it's a very specific component. And understanding the history of that that component for for reuse, so I think as we as we see digital product passport systems progress, we'll start to see that additional level of granularity. The challenge is how do you incentivize the capturing of that data uh, so that it can be used forty, fifty, or more years uh, from now, and that's 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 a, a challenge we have yet to resolve. I think absolutely. Oh, hey. Yeah, no, I'm, look, I think what you've said is true. Like, it's just, this is an, a burgeoning area. It's going to be hard, full stop. I think hey, if one probably key thing about the circularity question that we're trying to really emphasize is the there is a, a question about what gets demolished right now and how do you reuse and so on. But the the, mm -hmm. the amount of things that you can reuse and, and say, remanufacture and so on, the, that, realistically speaking, a good chunk of that is based on what decisions that someone made 60 years ago. What we're trying to do is make sure that in 60 years' time, we can recover a lot of this stuff, right? So it's easy to focus on the end output, which we should, don't get me wrong, absolutely, right now. But the thing that we haven't done very well is focusing on what the inputs are so that the end output in the future is going to be good. And that's that's a lot of the portion of what we're trying to do today, sending signals that we need to recover what we're getting rid of right now and repurpose and remanufacture and, and, and upcycle, for lack of a better word, but also think about what will happen in 50 years time or in feed outs, which is why we're starting in that space in seven years time, right? Like feed outs mm. get uh, like move very quickly through the supply chain. So seven, five to 10 years is a typical lifetime of a feed out. Can we change the circularity of that? If we can extend the feed out life a little bit more, if we can repurpose them and so on, that's significant savings in materials across the supply chain, full stop. Absolutely. And and that that really leans into John's question here about how do you stop projects like office fit outs and retail being churned? Look out for that fit outs consultation paper coming yep. shortly. Literally, Monday. Um, yeah. We missed it by one week. All right. I, re I really do need to pull it to a close. Jorge, I'll let you type the answer to that last question that we haven't. Oh, sure. Yep address. But thank you so much for joining us today. This webinar will be published on our ThinkStep ANZ webinar website, webinar website, um, so that you can have a look again, particularly if you'd like to understand in a little bit more detail some of the concepts that were covered today. Reach out to us if you'd like to talk more. And thanks again, particularly to Jorge for joining us and to Jim. Have a wonderful afternoon. We'll see you soon. We have many more webinar replays on a whole host of sustainability topics. You can check them out on our website and our YouTube channel.